Hello and good evening. Good evening, everyone. So glad to see you. My name is Patty Gallagher and on behalf of the Academic Senate, I would like to welcome you all, those of you here and those of you at home to the 56th Faculty Research Lecture. This lecture dates back to 1967 and is the longest standing campus event. The Faculty Research Lecture is held on every single UC campus and honors an illustrious faculty member, their contributions and their research. Before our speakers introduce the extraordinary work of our extraordinary colleague, I want to remind us that the land on which we gather is the unceded territory of the Awaswa-speaking Yupi tribe. The Amamutsan tribal band, comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to missions Santa Cruz and San Juan Bautista during the Spanish colonization of the Central Coast, is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship on practices on these lands and to heal from historical trauma. Thank you again for being with us tonight. We are so happy to celebrate the achievements of distinguished professor J.J. Garcia Luna Aceves of the Computer Science and Engineering Department. The nomination of Professor Garcia Luna Aceves was approved by enthusiastic acclaim uh, at the May 22 Senate meeting. I'd like to thank the 21-22 Committee on Faculty Research Lecture, Luca de Alfaro, Carolyn Dean, Howard Haber, Barbara Rogoff, and Ronaldo Wilson for nominating Professor Garcia Luna Aceves, and also to thank this year's CFRL for their support for this event. We are so happy to celebrate you. And now I'd like to invite CPEVC Lori Kletzer to the podium. Thank you, Patty. I am so happy to be here with you in person and for those of us joining us on the live stream to celebrate the 56th annual faculty research lecture. I want to congratulate JJ on this award, on this accomplishment. It is a prestigious recognition. You cannot find a more prestigious recognition on campus. As Patty noted, the faculty research lecture is peer driven. It is orchestrated by the Senate committee well, on the faculty research lecture. And whether or not this memory is correct, I want to share that I think my first and longest interaction with JJ is courtesy of the Senate. We served together on CPB. JJ, if my memory is wrong, just leave it as it is, please, because yeah. it, is, it is absolutely a wonderful memory. JJ's contributions are many through his research, his teaching, and his mentoring, particularly of his doctoral students and his service to the campus. I am particularly grateful to him for his ongoing, and now I guess I also have to say his outgoing, right, service as department chair of computer science and engineering. That's enough from me. We are here to celebrate JJ. And now I will pass the mic to Alex Wolf, Dean of the Baskin School of Engineering. Thank you, Lori, um, and uh, thank you to the Faculty Senate for um, making such a wonderful selection for uh, this honor. And uh, I will also not take uh, a lot of time because I just messed up his slides. Sorry. <laughs> what What is this, a computer? <laughs> Sorry, JJ. <laughs> Right. So I uh, actually, uh, well, well, actually, I'm a computer scientist too. So, um, and JJ and I uh, have been uh, distant colleagues for a very, very long time. And uh, I, I knew of JJ long before I actually was able to meet him. Um, but it has been a pleasure to have been uh, having this opportunity to spend some time and benefit from from JJ's membership in our. Uh, in our school. Um, I, I know that JJ has cited some of my papers. Uh, I'm not sure if JJ, I cited any of yours, but I should have checked that. But uh, no, I, I've always admired your work 
very, very much. And so uh, I'm really looking forward to this lecture. Um, the, this is a special year for Baskin Engineering. Baskin Engineering is celebrating its 25th anniversary. Uh, JJ has been here for all of that and longer. Uh, and he has witnessed uh, a tremendous growth of this, of this school and the taking up of a very, very important mission on the campus. And so this school is, is uh, as I like to say to many people, uh, it's now about a quarter of the undergraduate students and more than a third of the graduate students. And uh, JJ and his colleagues um, have had a tremendous uh, influence over the direction of the school um, in that time and have contributed tremendously to its success. Um, since 2016, we've increased the faculty by half. And in that same time, we've more than doubled our new research funding. So um, we have uh, benefited from JJ's uh, mentorship, leadership, most recently, JJ serving as chair of the computer science and engineering department. And um, in that role, he and I have worked very closely together and, uh, and very happily, I would say. So uh, thank you very much, JJ. And uh, I'm looking forward to your talk. I'll now introduce uh, Katya Braccia. And Katya will actually give a much more formal introduction of JJ. Um, so Katya, please. Thank you, Alex. And uh, so I'm here. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, distinguished professor JJ Garcia Luna Seves as uh, the presenter of the 56th uh, research, uh, faculty research lecture, which is titled, well, it's gone, um, Research Directions on Computer Communication Protocols for Intelligent uh, Information Infrastructures. Um, JJ, of course, uh, is an international, internationally recognized leader in his field, um, which is uh, computer networks. Um, and uh, um, if I were to enumerate his contributions and achievements, uh, he would probably run out of time. Oh, sorry. He will not have enough time to actually do his presentation. So I'll try to be brief. Um, so JJ received his bachelor's in science in electro engineering at the uni from the University of uh, um, Iberoamericana in Mexico City, and then his PhD and his master's and PhD uh, from University of Hawaii. Uh, so he usually jokes and says that uh, he liked to he wanted to go to Hawaii to surf, uh, but he was surfing the web, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and um, um, so JJ's research focuses on computer communications and computer networks. And now, as we know, computer networks are part of our uh, critical infrastructure, just like power and water systems. Um, so his, he has made seminal contributions to the field of computer networks. Um, his publication records is beyond outstanding. He has published over 500 peer reviewed uh, papers and book chapters. Um, and his uh, work has been cited over 40,000 times. Um, his uh, H index is 100, which is again, off the charts. And, um, and additionally, he holds 60 pa patents. Um, uh, that are spanning different uh, areas of computer communications. Um, JJ's work, um, again, spans a wide range of topics in computer networks, and he has made seminal contributions to the core functions of computer networks, including uh, routing protocols, which are protocols that uh, decide how packets or messages are being sent from the source to the destination. Um, and uh, have, his work has made a very big impact on routing protocols, including a, the first provably correct protocol that is loop-free, meaning that uh, has no loops when delivering packets. And that actually was um, incorporated by Cisco 
early on in as part of one of their routing protocols. Um, uh, JJ has also made seminal contributions in the area of um, wireless channel um, control, which uh, are protocols that decide when stations that are sharing a shared communication channel have access to the medium. And uh, um, so he has made several contributions in, in that area. Um, and of course, his awards are innumerous, and I have a list of them here. He's a fellow of the IEEE, a fellow of the ACM, and a fellow of the AAAS. He uh, received the IEEE Computer Society Technical Achievement Award in 2011 uh, for pioneering contributions to the theory and design of communication protocols for ad hoc wireless networks. Uh, the IEEE Communication Society Ad Hoc and Sensor Networks Technical Committee uh, Technical Recognition Award in 2012 for fundamental contributions to the theory and design of communication protocols for routing and channel access. Uh, so I'm cheating here. Um, at UCSC, JJ has been the director of the Computer Communication Research Group, the COPO group, uh, as we all uh, call it, and Coco, um, and has graduated 40 plus PhD students. Some of them are here tonight to celebrate his achievements. And, uh, and over 40 master's students. Um, as you can see, they have come back uh, to celebrate JJ in this uh, you know, uh, amazing, um, uh, celebration. Um, JJ has uh, also been uh, instrumental in, in uh, getting uh, the computer, uh, computer science and engineering department off the ground. He has been serving as the department chair. Now the, the CSC department is the largest one on campus. Um, and uh, he has also been the director of Citrus, which is the Center for Information Technology Research in the Interest of Society, which is a center that spans multiple campuses, um, uh, the UC campuses. Um, and it was established in 2001. Um, JJ has been an amazing leader, a, an amazing colleague and a role model and um, a mentor, especially, especially for me, I consider him my mentor. I've, you know, when I came to UCSC, uh, he was already here and we work in a, in similar, in a similar uh, research area. And, uh, you know, he, that made a lot of difference. Um, so without further ado, I would like to um, welcome Professor, distinguished Professor JJ Garcia Luna Seves and to give his talk. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you all for being here. I know it's a long drive for some, and it's a long night for all of us, especially once we break and start uh, enjoying the festivity, for sure. Um, it's uh, uh, an honor beyond telling uh, to be here, sharing with you some, some ideas, and uh, I, I just uh, want to thank all of the UCSC family for allowing me to have 30 wonderful years of fun. And uh, especially just uh, working with bright young people and be, being able to pretend that I'm teaching them something when in fact I'm learning from them all the time. So um, I, what I want to do <clears throat> today is uh, give you a, a, a snapshot of some ideas that uh, I'm, I'm working on uh, in collaboration with, with students on uh, what to do with communication protocols for intelligent information infrastructures. And you may wonder what the heck are intelligent information infrastructures. So uh, they stole my thunder already, but still. Uh, it's a fancy way to say networks. It turns out that uh, once you start using something that is essential and very useful, people think the, the, that something just works. 
but in fact, it's always evolving. And uh, uh, um, IQ is basically for the purposes of this talk, simply networks, but networks are pretty much everywhere. No matter, there, there is no computing and co uh, computational intelligence today without networks. So we can talk about uh, infrastructure networks, social networks, information networks, even networks within what we consider chips or tiny pieces of, of hardware. All of that is uh, uh, enabled because of networks. So networks are uh, these um, essential entities that allow people to connect with one another and to share information, services, and more and more even things. So uh, that, once I have gotten that out of the, of the way, then the question is, uh, uh, the second question is, what are communication protocols for the purposes of this talk? And all of us are familiar with communication protocols because humans and animals and artificial entities all use communication protocols, which we can think informally as social conventions, known practices, and more formally as specific, specific methods that are formally or informally specified. In particular, uh, if, we, if we think about how people communicate, when we are next to each other, it's very easy to, to share information. But if we are in larger and larger groups, then we need uh, a, a more disciplined approach to communication. We need to, what, what people say, be polite with one another, pass the floor, and let everybody share information. Uh, when we talk about, uh, again, when we are near each other, it's very easy to exchange information without much trouble. But when people are uh, perhaps uh, a bit farther away from each other, or there is some uh, a noise environment, then we have to repeat what we say. Or maybe uh, people like me that I don't hear very well, they, they, I need you to shout, uh, especially in big classrooms, like uh, for 107 when I was teaching 400 students, or repeat uh, uh, information because, uh, because of the uh, uh, environmental noise. Uh, when we're even farther apart, we, we are no longer able to rely on just being able to reach one another directly. So we, rely, we need to rely on relays. And uh, the, the uh, human approach to, to this is basically we pass uh, messages uh, uh, on papers, like in high school, we pass all these papers uh, to one another to say, oh, I don't like this class and what am I doing here? Uh, and we, so we forward the information uh, uh, in that way. Uh, we, but then again, it is, it's not the case that there is a, a very clear way to, to relay information. And even more, more than that, it's not always the case that the source, the destination and the relays are perfect. So we have, again, to re resend the information. We have to uh, uh, relay information multiple times, and there has to be a way to do so. And ultimately, what we uh, do with communication protocols is all about sharing content, services, things, and our presence. We, we, like uh, Zoom is the perfect uh, example nowadays of sharing our presence. All of that means communication protocols, which, for the purposes of networks, uh, brings uh, uh, along a plethora of protocols that have been designed over, over many years by giants of, of the field. We are all familiar with Wi-Fi, uh, especially when it doesn't work. Um, we are all familiar with uh, repeating information. Uh, uh, we are all familiar with uh, the internet uh, and IP and uh, routing protocols. Uh, uh, Cisco is very familiar with e EIGRP. Uh, and then, uh, uh, all of this is happening in the in the uh, as the plumbing of the internet, but we need a window uh, between the the internet, the, the the core of the internet, and what the applications want to do ultimately, or what people want to do, and that's uh, what is called the transport layer. And today, we we uh, some are familiar with uh, UDP and TCP and other protocols which provide that window between what the applications want and what the infrastructure can provide. And all of that is again, for the purposes of sharing content, presence, services, and things. Uh, examples of these protocols is HTTP and uh, uh, VoIP and other protocols. So uh, the, the, I bring all of these because I wanted to make a, a, a short point that um, goes to the uh, 
a very brief, this is the Reader's Digest version of the history of the internet. And it all started in the 1960s when Paul Barron, uh, the Rand Corporation did the, all these studies on what he called packet switching. And uh, uh, that created an explosion of, of uh, ingenuity in, in the government and in academia and industry. And uh, uh, I, I bring two particular uh, aspects, which is the Aloha channel and the what it was called by uh, Surf and Can, the transmission control program. And uh, you'll see why I bring those two in, in highlight. But uh, the, so there has been uh, from the, the, um, birth, uh, the, the birth date of, the, of uh, the internet in the 1960s to today, this ends at the 2018 because I didn't have enough uh, 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 slide space. But uh, the, what is uh, important to, to uh, notice is for the purposes of this talk is that all of these uh, protocols were developed long time ago by giants of the field. And if we look carefully at, 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 a, at a more detailed history of the internet, we realize that the core algorithms that are being used today, as we speak, even when we have ChatGPT and all these amazing AI and machine learning going on in servers and clients, we still have, are using algorithms that date 40, 50 years uh, uh, ago. So it's a very long time ago. Why is that important? Um, well, it's important for me because I make my living doing protocols, but why would it be important for you? Uh, so it is true that uh, Aloha, uh, all these other protocols, CSMA, TCP, IP, the domain name system, shortest path routing, they are amazing cre uh, creations and amazing inventions, but uh, uh, they were great in the 60s and the 80s, and they still are. But so you may ask, well, why are we, are we bothering with, with the same old, same old, old story about protocols. Well, the, the, the issue from my perspective is that all of these uh, uh, designs were developed at a time when the computing power available was many, many orders of magnitude uh, 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 less than what we have today. Uh, 50 years ago, we didn't have the, the computing power we have today. There are many ways that people have described this, uh, this uh, evolution of computing power over the years. But one I like in particular because it has very funny drawings is this one, which uh, dates to a 1998 uh, um, talk uh, that I, I had the, the benefit of, of finding. And what it shows is uh, uh, over time, uh, what is the uh, 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 millions of instructions per second available uh, for use uh, for $1,000 in $97 value? And it is dated, of course, but you can still see the drastic change in compute power. And this is a, a, with a change that has been witnessed and change that uh, is projected. So why that this is important is because if we look back again, uh, we put this together with the brief history of the internet and we realize that the ARPANET and the internet were designed, the algorithms for both were designed at a time when the computing power available to the designers, the giants of the time was the equivalent of bacterium brains. So why, why that matters is because today we are at a point, and that's why we have all these phenomena like G, uh, uh, chat GPT and many other things. We have far more power, computing power available to us. So what does that mean to the likes of me who love communication protocols and networking? And what does it mean to society at large if we could exploit this newly found or newly evolved uh, power? computing power. So for that, we, can, we need to look at, uh, at a more formal perspective of what a communication protocol is. And no matter whether we talk about human communication protocols or protocols uh, that are uh, 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 carried out by living things, um, or uh, protocols that are being de devised for artificial things, it all, they all, all communication protocols are defined by the services the protocols are meant to provide. 
the environment or context uh, that within which the protocol operates, uh, the vocabulary used for the exchange of information, and more importantly for the purposes of, of my talk, the procedural rules that govern the, the communication such that the, the, the rules guard the consistency of the ex information exchange and guarantee that the protocol is, main, is, is, is doing what the protocol is meant to do. And uh, if we look at, uh, uh, going back to my, to my points about the state of the art today, the, what we want to have uh, is a communication protocol that makes sense for the time. And if we look at how uh, an entity that carries out a communication protocol operates, we can think in general as having a node that has some brains uh, that interprets the data that it receives from other parties or from the environment, whatever that environment may be. And then it, it uh, senses some reward in, the, in the, the steps it has taken, and it knows the current state, and based on, on the information, a reward system, and the current state, it decides what to, what to do next, and communicates with uh, interested parties and the, with the environment. And it's all a cycle of sensing, deciding, act, and actuating on the basis of the information exchanged and gathered. And those of you in computer science will, will realize that I stole this uh, from your typical reinforcement learning slide. But since we're in engineering, this is just, uh, I mean, I was being efficient and reusing the information. <clears throat> so uh, we know what a communication protocol is in, in more formal terms and what the communication protocol entity does or how it operates. And then the next question, whether well, that's the case, then what is wrong with today's protocols? Again, we go back to the slide I, I showed you before, and the, even the structure, the, the, the way we used to structure protocols today dates back to the 70s and 80s. And that, that uh, is important because that's when computing uh, storage uh, and links were really expensive. Uh, then each layer had to work independently. Why? Because it's expensive to, to do processing. It was expensive to do processing. Each layer depends on a specific server that, by the layer be, uh, below. Why? Because it was expensive to do processing. Uh, and each layer, as we will see uh, in particular in this talk, each layer uses very limited information. Why? Again, it was too expensive not to do so. And Again, many of the algorithms in use today in the internet as we speak and in this room with our Wi-Fi, et cetera, are based on really old algorithms. And uh, why that matters is because uh, all of these uh, designs were made for bacteria brains, not for the type of brains we can enjoy today. And th th that's what, what we, we witness in, in the protocol structure that we are using today. And uh, that is a problem because it makes the whole internet kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. If you, if you, one of the pieces don't quite work, like your Wi-Fi doesn't quite work or TCP kind of doesn't quite work because of your mobile or because you are, you are multi-homing, whatever, then the whole, your whole purpose of sharing information goes down the drain. So if we look at uh, then the, the way in which uh, protocol entities are operating as we speak, then we realize the, the, a big problem based on the fact that the protocols were designed 40, 50 years ago. And the big problem is the data interpreters we're using are just totally rudimentary and not at all on par with what we could do or imagine today. And uh, so by design, we, what we have as a result is that the nodes executing the communication protocols interact with a, a whole bunch of constraints that today are really quite artificial. There is no reason to have those constraints in place. And use, they use very limited data. Again, with no reason for that to happen because we could use far more data if we just had the right design. So the, the, then given all of this um, rationale, the, the, the next step in, in, in our thinking process is, well, we know that bacterium, bacteria don't, are not very intelligent. So if we want to change things, what if we let the um, 
intelligent information infrastructure or networks of the future act more like humans than bacteria. And um, that's the purpose of, of uh, 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 the few ideas I'm, I'm sharing with you today. Um, so what if we allow the, the routers and the servers and the clients and the things uh, in the IoT to remember far more information, process a whole bunch more information and use all this much more information in context. If you think about it, there is no intelligent behavior without memory. If you don't remember anything, how can you take intelligent actions? If you don't uh, process what you know and develop new information, how can you evolve and, and uh, set new goals and change your state? So um, the, the, this talk focuses on what if we really allow the nodes to remember much more? And uh, it's a long story, as you can imagine, and we are uh, engaged in, in a lot of work. But I have two examples uh, that I hope are, are sort of familiar because we all use Wi-Fi and we all uh, use uh, the web. So I chose uh, these two examples. One is uh, what if um, we were to reimagine the Aloha channel? And uh, again, uh, the Aloha channel was the precursor to Wi-Fi and satellite communications and everything that that is done today on uh, packet based on on packet switching over uh, wireless channels. So and again, the the goal from the humanistic perspective is to be polite, let everybody share information, and pass the floor as a as a way to let everybody share what they have to say. And uh, I fell in love with Aloha. <clears throat> Uh, a, a few years ago, we, we won't say when, um, uh, and Aloha was the first uh, Mac protocol used for packet switching. And it was the, the, the one reason I, went, I decided to go to the University of Hawaii and my mentor Frank Kuo and Abramson were, uh, I thought they were developing the Aloha system. By the time I got, I got to Hawaii, it was over, but you know, they used it, Aloha is done. Nevertheless, I learned a lot from, from, from them. Uh, the beauty of Aloha is, in, in addition to being the first MAC protocol for packet switching networks, it was uh, the simplicity. It was uh, Abramson. I fell in love with, with the equation that Abramson uh, gave in, in, his, in his paper, in 1970 paper. And I, it was just kind of blew my mind as to how we could explain on tethered, uh, sharing of a resource in such a simple way. So uh, but uh, it, it was the, the beauty of Aloha is that it's simple, everybody loves it, which is a, a, a suitable uh, thing for, for because Aloha means love in Hawaiian. And but the the, the price we pay with Aloha is that the performance is horrible as a uh, as we show here, is basically you get less than 20% of the channel capacity if, if you let everybody just talk at, without any, any politeness, which is basically Aloha. But still, it has been a forcing function for the past 50 plus years. We had a celebration uh, um, in the Silicon Valley Center to honor Aloha and the, the, all the great things that it produced in, uh, over time. Um, but um, the, the thing is, uh, we know it has to change, but if, but if we, we have solutions that change Aloha, we know we can apply those same solutions to Wi-Fi and to all these other evolving standards for 5G, 6G, or next G, if you will. Um, so the, the early design of Aloha was uh, assuming a central node, the Menehune, but uh, along came, along, uh, along came uh, Tobaji and Kleinrock, and in 1978, they proposed an approach to make Aloha be, and uh, carrier sense multiple access, be some, uh, some method that can be applied on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, meaning you don't have to have a base station that tells the nodes, okay, you can talk next, or, or here's your, your acknowledgement. So they proposed a very simple way for, for uh, Aloha to be applied to peer-to-peer uh, networks in, in radio channels. And it was basically the use of what they call priority acts. 
And the, the, the magic change to Aloha was, okay, we have a, a data packet sent. If the nodes perceive that the data has been received, then they wait longer to give a, ch a, a chance to uh, an acknowledgement, be priority to the acknowledgement that needs to come from the receiver for of, of the, uh, the intended receiver of the packet. So if you think about it, this, this simple action amounts to a very tiny amount of uh, working memory capacity put to good use. It's basically, uh, you, you, you remember, okay, I, I received the packet, one bit of information will suffice to remember that, and I wait long enough for the act to come by. So that was great, and it was a, a seminal paper in 1978. Um, I asked uh, my students to still read that paper sometimes. Um, but if you think about it, that's, not, that's great, but it's not good enough for peer-to-peer -peer communications because people, they remember more than one bit of information when they, they interact with one another. They remember who is there, who uh, has something more important to say, but they, they, they remember uh, by remembering who is in the room and who, or who is in the group, they start naturally uh, evolving into politeness, polite behavior, and give everybody a chance to talk. And we don't need, the, uh, normally, unless you are in my classroom, you don't need anybody to tell you, you talk, you talk, you talk. So it's, it's a natural human uh, uh, approach to being polite. And there is no reason we shouldn't allow aloha to be to be similar to that. Why it wasn't done is because memory 50 years ago was extremely expensive. And what Abramson and Kuo had to do was to do a very efficient design for channel access protocols. So it was too expensive in 1968, but working memory capacity, capacity today is their cheap. Uh, all of the, of, of course, there have been a ton of work uh, improving Aloha. Uh, the first that comes to mind is Larry Roberts' work on uh, slotted Aloha that essentially assumed uh, that there was some way to synchronize the transmissions from all the nodes uh, by some central entity. And by doing so, it reduced the, the amount of time during which packets were subject to interference. So uh, it was great. And uh, even even more recently, people are still using slotted Aloha to say, okay, we can do better than Aloha. And in fact, uh, my dear colleague Luca and I have been, uh, we are guilty of applying intelligence to slotted Aloha, like better than most, I, I would dare say. But still, we, we had to assume this slotting uh, approach. Why that's a problem is because we need physical layer support, meaning some clock synchronization. So what if, um, can we, well, uh, how can we improve Aloha dramatically to mimic more and more what people do without using all these constructs of the physical layer, without requiring clock synchronization or fancy radios or any of that? Um, what if we just uh, look at using the working memory capacity of the nodes? Can we do something meaningful with that? Uh, in essence, what we're asking is, well, why don't we let Aloha imitate people in, in, in the sense that I, I described before, that people know who, who is in the group and they start taking turns naturally. So what we, what we did um, was uh, allow the nodes to remember who is talking in the group. And uh, by uh, our, our implementation of that notion was what we call the network, uh, uh, network understood index. You, would, you may say, uh, why, why we, I, I would choose this silly name is because Nui in Hawaiian means uh, much. And uh, you put Aloha and Nui together is much love, which is quite nice. It's a homage to my mentor. Oops. So um, if we allow this uh, uh, working memory capacity to grow substantially compared to the one bit of the Kleiner Kantobaji proposed, then what it turns out is, as we have shown in, in our papers, that Aloha Nui basically very quickly over time builds what amounts to a transmission schedule that is dynamically derived by the nodes listening and remembering who is there talking successfully. And then over time, still allowing some 
periods of time during which newcomers can come in and say, hey, can I join the party or, or uh, is, there, are there, is there some wine left in the, in the uh, cocktail party? So all of this works just like it should, it, it should work, but provided that we allow the nodes to remember who they are and uh, who's talking and try to be polite. And if we are polite, then we derive uh, dynamic schedules quite easily. Um, a key thing with this uh, natural behavior of uh, uh, information exchange in a shared resource, or just by allowing um, memory capacity and the notes is that we allow uh, for the purposes of channel access variable length data packets without the need for anybody to dictate the, the, the starting and ending times of transmissions. They, they not just talk uh, uh, as long as they want to talk, but we, we limit the transmission time of any one active talker to some maximum amount of time because otherwise if you are like, if you have me in the room, then I won't stop talking. So you have to stop me at one point so that everybody shares the channel eventually. So with this just simple idea of basically allowing memory to dictate uh, the natural transmission schedules, what we did uh, next was uh, use the same um, beautiful um, math that uh, started with Abramson and grew with Kleinrock, Tobaji, and many of his students. And we showed using the same mathematical model that uh, if you do Aloha Nui, you get to this crazy looking equation, but the, what is important is not the form of the equation, but the fact that this is Aloha, uh, Aloha and this is what uh, CSMA did. This is Wi-Fi in a, in a fully connected setting. And this is uh, time division multiple axis that somebody is telling the, the nodes when to transmit all the time. And uh, the effect of the working memory capacity is, in my opinion, striking because you see that if we compare what Aloha Nui does to all the previous protocols, scheduled channel access or uh, contention-based channel access, it's, uh, all, all, it's always better. And uh, why, why you may ask what's not done before is because people have been focusing on the wrong thing. People have been focusing on what is the, the best uh, efficient use of a time slot, for example, rather than what is the most efficient use of the common or the best way to provide the most efficient way to provide the common good, which is everybody talks eventually within some final amount of time. Um, to do that, we need to remember who is in the room. Um, I won't bother you with the details, but th this is just the beginning as I, I uh, elicit in the slide. There is a ton of things that we plan to do next, including applying this to Wi-Fi and 5G and 6G and other standards, and making sure that this works also with multiple channels and on a multi-hop basis. But enough said about uh, modeling. Uh, nowadays, to publish a, a paper that is easily accepted in a conference, you have to provide more than you, your equations. You have to provide simulation results or implementation in actual hardware. So we did uh, Royal We. Uh, professors don't do that much simulation, but I, I pretend. So we, we simulated Aloha Nui, uh, and uh, we compared the throughput and uh, with of Aloha Nui with Aloha CSMA, which is Wi-Fi, and TDMA, which is the military standard for what is efficient. And we, uh, I don't know if you can see, but uh, you can see that Aloha Nui is always better. You can think of Aloha Nui having the effect of the schedule is in the minds of the nodes, rather than uh, uh, a, a station telling the nodes when to transmit, or somebody in the military predefining the, the entire schedule and de, uh, de, defi defining the schedule ahead of time. So all of this happens dynamically. And again, if you uh, were wondering why, uh, what Aloha Nui means is basically much love because I think there is a ton of things to continue doing with Aloha if we just let the nodes uh, use far more memory. So that's one, there is ample ample uh, fruitful work to be done at the channel access level. But um, I, I wanted to also show a second example. Um, 
I, I'm assuming I'll have enough time, but I, I understand that I'm, I'm, I'm the, the, what is stopping you from, from the great cocktail party we're having afterwards. So I'll, I'll try to be as brief as I can in professor speak. So my students know what that means. So uh, the, now we focus our attention to, to the internet uh, at large. And um, those of uh, all of us who use the internet, we do uh, the web, we serve the web. That's the only type of serving I could do in Hawaii. And uh, it's about uh, resending messages uh, that, because the sender, the receiver, or the relays are not quite working well for the purpose of sharing content services, things, and presence. And all of us, when you, we use the web, we have to use a communication protocol at the what is called the transport layer, which provides the window between the what the application on, on user wants and what the infrastructure can provide. And uh, it all started, uh, like many things, with ARPANET. The, uh, in 1968, um, uh, Steve Crocker, Surf, and many others uh, invented the first uh, what is what's called the host-to-host -host protocol and um, the network control it was called notice the, the nomenclature the network control program the, the the notion of protocols was not quite set at the time so uh steve crocker and 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 been served provided this uh it was an explosion in in uh, at the time uh to think of a way in which some computers were using some packet switching, whatever that meant, network called ARPANET to share information. And uh, the, the, the importance of NCP was, it was the first host to host protocol over a packet switching network. The limitations of NCP was, were many, but one in particular is that it, it, it assumed uh, mainly because of being served that the ARPANET was a link. And it, uh, under that assumption, it developed all, all of these. Uh, can you tell me again what you said, please? And, and all of these functions of NCP. And also, it assumed a lot of uh, help from the routing infrastructure. Why was that? Because ARPA con controlled the packet switching universe at the time, and why not? But then uh, the ARPANET became really successful. And uh, there was more than more than the ARPANET. There was Ethernet, SATnet, and uh, a whole uh, and the, the the Aloha system. So there was a need for something more than a host-to-host -host protocol that could work in a single network. And along came uh, in uh, 1974, uh, Vincef and Bob Kahn, who won the Turing Award for their contributions to exactly how the internet evolved from here, which was uh, based on the transmission control program. And uh, the, the beauty of their thinking was that they kind of uh, broke away from uh, assuming a single network and one administration controlling the packet switching universe and they allowed anybody can play. Um, and you can have a packet, you can have a packet, you can have a packet. So it was, a wonderful development, and I was at SRI when we were deploying TCP, uh, what became TCP, and uh, the the beauty, conceptual beauty of what Vint, Surf, and Bo uh, Bob Kahn proposed was they viewed the exchange, the, the communication between two remote processes as uh, an association, and that's important as we will see. To, to make a difference between an association uh, as, as, a, as a thinking uh, device or a thinking piece and the implementation of an association. An association is uh, basically what you, you would expect. Of, uh, two remote processes can talk to each other if and only if they know each other by name or so they, they can say, I'm talking, I am talking to you and they know the context that they are sharing. Because if, if, we, if I don't uh, understand what you're talking about, then there is no communication. So uh, uh, identifying the processes, the communication, communicating processes and providing the context is basically the association. And the connection basically is just an implementation of an association. And uh, the, uh, uh, Vint and, and Bob basically use the addresses 
and what we call the ports or the windows and the OS to the to the network uh, to denote the processes. And uh, they chose an initial uh, common sequence number uh, uh, that denotes the, the, uh, the that uh, labels a byte that is being exchanged. And uh, <clears throat> there is a good reason for that. I mean, uh, uh, back then in the 70s, there was a very good reason for that. So um, the transmission control program became TCP and IP. And uh, you may say, well, okay, that was a long time ago. Why on, why on earth would Vint and Bob and then Carl Songshen, who was uh, Vint's uh, uh, student, and uh, Johan Dalal and John Postel at ISI, why would they keep with connections? Um, even even uh, when uh, Postel and company uh, moved from the transmission control program to TCP IP and UDP as, as, a, as an internet standard. Um, so and the, the, to make a long story short, using connections made just sense in the 70s and 80s because uh, is the most efficient in terms of memory, is the most efficient way you can use to establish context. All you have to do uh, to, to uh, start the context going is to always remember an initial sequence number for a byte, and what is the latest byte that has been shared uh, correctly and in sequence between the communicating parties. If you do that, you can, you can have uh, reliable, communi excuse me, reliable communication. So this is great. It has been working since the, we started to deploy TCP in uh, the uh, ARPANET and the D, uh, uh, DDN long time ago uh, at SRI and other places, but we pay a tremendous price for this simplicity. And the price we pay is that a connection is ephemeral and is, is uh, if, if anything happens, uh, uh, the receiver at the sender or in the relaying structure the the whole uh, connection goes away and we have to restart and that's what you see when you are you get frustrated with wi-fi or you're moving around and there is a blind spot in your coverage and then the, what you were doing is toast um so it's very hard to uh, maintain connections uh, in a very dynamic and evolving network so um as a result, the, the state of the art in communication uh, internet transfer protocols today is rather primitive. Even if you talk about quick or multipath TCP and all these fancy new versions of, of connection-based protocols is still really primitive. Because what happens is for those of you who have, who have uh, 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 dared to look at the state machine of TCP or quick or these protocols, is some they are beasts and it's very complex state machines that are in charge of keeping track of very simple um, uh, context, a byte. What, what is the, the, the latest byte that has been exchanged uh, properly? So as a result, uh, what we see is we still have a very rudimentary interpreter in the TCP agents that we are in, using today. And uh, the senders and the receivers in TCP basically collaborate kind of blindly with respect to what the application really wants to have done. And not surprisingly, we have a lot of pro performance problems and all these limitations that I'm listing in my slide. And it's very hard to you take advantage of the fact that today in the internet, there is a ton of storage available, but we cannot use that storage freely because a connection is between one IP address and port to another IP address and port. And uh, doing away with that needs something other than connections. Um, so how can we, again, going back to the theme of this talk is how can we use massive amounts or not so massive amounts, so, so larger amounts of working memory capacity to fix these limitations of connections. But before we can, dare to say to to jump into into that uh, noble cause we have to ask whether or not connections are necessary for associations among communicating processes remotely 
and um, I would like to claim uh, uh, the the first thought about the subject. But alas, there are many giants that uh, in the field that came before us, and it turns out that uh, there is no need for connections to support end-to-end -end reliable communications in the internet. Um, way back when uh, Surf and Can were doing TCP, uh, uh, a fellow David Walden uh, proposed an entirely different approach. It was a, it was a message passing approach. And uh, he wrote uh, uh, in 1975 this uh, alternative and he published uh, an earlier version of his thoughts in the communications of the ACM. And uh, the, what he, David Walden proposed is really simple. Think of uh, the way humans communicate. We have a sender and a receiver and think of this uh, um, uh, what, what the, the, he called them uh, monitors, but think of this as mailboxes. And then there is a mechanism for the mailboxes to exchange the, the messages. And then you just have to talk to your mail, local mailbox and vice versa. So to make a long story short, what David Walton pro uh, proposed way back in the 70s is entirely feasible and uh, can replace connections. Um, and in fact, a connect, what is a connection becomes uh, rather than this ephemeral construct, a sequence of fleeting uh, receive, send, and data transactions. And those in computer science know that trans uh, atomic transactions are wonderful. So chances are we can live with uh, this approach if we take it to fruition. Um, but uh, luckily for the likes of us, or, or me, um, he didn't complete the whole picture, mainly because BBN moved on and T uh, TCP became it. And uh, so there was never a, a, a detailed thought as to how do we manage these, uh, these uh, monitors uh, and put them to good use. So um, then the question becomes, given that we have, we have uh, David Walden, uh, shown by example that we don't need connections to uh, est establish end-to-end -end reliable communication, then how do we replace connections with a different construct that is uh, more like David Walden's construct? And um, um, to, to think about how to do it uh, based on David, Wal David Walden's in insight, we have to, again, just remember that an association is about naming the, of the communicating processes and using some context to allow the processes to understand what they are talking to one another. And uh, so uh, we needed some name other than connections or connectionless because those are taken. So we, I came up with the term nexus uh, to implement associations. The same way that uh, a connection is just an implementation of an association, a nexus is just an implementation of an association. And a nexus consists of some naming for simplicity and to publish papers quickly. Uh, we, I chose to use the, the same ports and IP addresses that are familiar with uh, those working with UDP. And, uh, and then the context, we, this is massive amount of more storage than the latest byte exchanged in, in, uh, in, in proper sequence correctly. So we said, okay, let's, let's talk about having lots of working memory capacity and allow the nodes to remember their context explicitly and make references to the context explicitly. So we have a, what well, it has been called in many settings, a manifest, which is a description of the data being exchanged among communicating parties. And uh, 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 the minimalist approach to think of, uh, of a manifest is basically, uh, we have to have a, a, a unique and never changing name uh, for very important computer science reasons, but the time is too short to get into that. But let's think of names that never change and are uniquely assigned. And it also establishes, this describes the structure of what is being exchanged and uh, a, a procedure that the receiver needs to use to decode the data being exchanged, which has the structure established in the manifest. <clears throat> and all the messaging that takes place makes explicit reference to the manifest, which is to say that when the processes talk to each other, they share explicitly the context they are within which they are talking. 
And uh, so we put this to good use, this uh, basic idea to good use. And we propose what I call, uh, uh, Aziz and, and myself call Internet Transport Protocol, and which is, to our knowledge, the first connection-free reliable transport protocol. And uh, it uses a, a, what is some call receiver-initiated uh, message passing approach, meaning that the process that wants the information asks for it and tells the, the process that has the information, I am interested in this data. And uh, there are three types of messages. Basically, uh, the, the, the processes need to establish their context with the manifest. Then the, the, the receiver needs to keep sending the interest that, that it has. And then the, 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 the process with the data sends the, the data packets. So it's kind of natural to have these three types of messages. Um, and again, there is uh, always explicit reference to the context. And that's important because it, uh, contrary to TCP, we don't really care how the messages flow in the internet, if they are repeated, lost, whatever. We don't, we don't really care because the receiver knows what the receiver has and what the receiver needs. And, um, and for convenience, we implemented this on top of UDP, which is what uh, you use to, to do transactions on the internet. And we published a, a paper as all all professors and grad students should do all the time. And uh, there's a long story to go along with the, with the ITP, but it just I'll give you a snapshot of how a nexus works in practice. And think of a, of a, a connection, you establish the connection, you send data, you, the connection fails, you have to establish the connection and then you terminate the, the connection. And if you cannot terminate the connection, you have to retry re to terminate the connection. So it's a, it's a big mess as the TCP state machine shows. So rather than doing all of that, basically on following uh, David Walden's approach, we have the, the client saying to the, to the, to the server, this, I, I, want, I want this by name. And then the server sends, uh, uh, creates a manifest and uh, has memory of that and sends that description to the, to the receiver. And the receiver keeps sending interest after that. And data packets, go back to the to the receiver. So contrary to TCP and all these solid connection oriented protocols, the association ends at a timeout or when the consumer gets tired or is, is really simple state machine. More than simplicity though, is that uh, um, if we look at how uh, ITP, the, the, basic, the basic message passing works using nexuses or compared to connections or compared to boiling the ocean and changing the entire routing infrastructure like Van Jacobson and others have proposed in the past, we see that uh, ITP is by far better than TCP or uh, information-centric networking approaches proposed recently. And uh, um, we are, just to show that, uh, we, we use the same algorithms that TCP uses uh, in many uh, implementations to show that Next, the Nexus approach is enhanced better than the than the connection approach, and uh, it, the, the the figures are too uh, they, they are too kind of um, blurry to see back there. But it's basically time versus queue size in bytes, and the what is called the congestion window, uh, which means uh, how many how many packets are in 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 in, in fly. But the 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 intent of this is not to allow you to read all of this, but just to make sure that you understand that uh, a transaction approach is inherently better than the connection approach. Um, so and why, is the, why should that be the case? It's because the receiver knows what the receiver wants and what the receiver needs. And there is no, there, there is no need for heurist, clever heuristics uh, that, that we have in connections. In addition to that, we can uh, assume that uh, if we have me uh, memory in, inside the network, can we do? Can we take advantage of that? And uh, alas, we can. We we have shown that uh, ITP provides as 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 good uh, total uh, download time as uh, boiling the ocean and changing the routing infrastructure with information-centric networking. And for that, uh, Aziz, who is now a uh, professor uh, in Saudi Arabia and myself got a best paper award, which is 
uh, as much as much as we can hope to get, uh, since we don't get any cash from uh, papers. So, c'est la vie. Uh, so, there are no changes to the to IP, the routing infrastructure, the domain name system, the way which which we name things in the internet, and uh, we can plan these proxies transparently in the internet, and uh, we will have far better performance than we can hope to have today. So. Uh, I have been talking a long time, which is not unusual as those students who know me know. Uh, so we have a very prolific uh, future, I think, a very fruitful uh, or promising future for networking or IQ uh, as in this light. Um, but the future research that is needed in networking at large is not about uh, like many papers have done recently using machine learning and AI uh, on outdated or old communication protocols like uh, slotted aloha or shortest path routing or connection-based mechanisms like that. Uh, the, the, the beauty or, or the exciting part of the research agenda in the future for networking is to reimagine what we can do for our protocol designs to make the information infrastructure behave more and more like people do. And not exactly like people because they are artificial things, but if we just allow them to have far more working memory capacity and some uh, amount of reinforcement learning, for example, and a lot of processing power, how can we re reinvent the internet uh, in some ways to make it far more efficient, far, uh, to, to bring just more justice to the internet, to make it fair, <clears throat> and uh, to keep professors and grad students occupied? And uh, so, the one last the last slide is basically the quest is to bring our data interpreter to the 21st century and to really think of the transport layer as the memory of the internet humans don't have application level memory we have memory and we use the same memory bank for all the things we do same thing with the internet we should have a layer of memory and context with, with which we allow our interpreter to take actions that are more meaningful because we remember what, who is talking, what are we talking about, and what decisions and what reward system we can establish. So um, I dare say that maybe we can think of the future networks as becoming large distributed learning engines that are in charge of allowing us to share uh, process, uh, share up services, content, our presence, and things with one another. And with that, I thank you and aloha nui loa. for the great talk and illuminating talk. And uh, now um, we can open the floor, you know, the floor ah. for questions. Thank you. So we have a microphone and then uh, if anyone wants to ask questions. For the record, they didn't tell me there was going to be a midterm. Oh, hey, JJ. Uh, hey, DJ. <laughs> DJ, I, I graduated in uh, in 2010. I uh, was a PhD student, and uh, and I've got a question for you. I got a always bothered him with questions, so, so here we go. Um, I'm wondering if, um, as you talked about working memory, I think it's it's really cool um, when you think about WMC. Is it is it somehow where you see the future where you're moving the um, the logic, which is sort of shifted to the application layer, to be able to do all of the transactions about the sessions and whatnot into the network, do you sort of see it where a future where WMC is sort of bartered by different routers? Routers are saying, hey, I need more WMC, give me more WMC, because that's a more efficient way of sending these um, packets over to you, because 
you ask yep. for, I don't know, a, net, a new Netflix TV show, like the, you want the first five episodes, you know, that's when you subscribe to the manifest. So I know how to get that over to you. You don't have to keep asking, you know, over a TCP protocol. So it makes sense. But do you sort of envision the negotiations of WMC happening automatically down in the future? Okay, so the the proper uh, the official answer is good question which means i don't know but i that never stopped me from answering questions so i i think what happens the working memory capacity is just uh we have to allow just uh, uh, resources that are very cheap to be used freely throughout the system is like in in a i've been watching a lot of uh soccer because uh because that's what people do. Uh, so it's like in, a, in, a, in a soccer team, you don't have any one player uh, doing everything, even if you have uh, Messi work, uh, in your team. So I think there is, a, there is a, a place for lots of working memory capacity in, adult, in all places, in the cloud, in the near server, in the clients, in the routers, in the switches, in the things. Because, uh, and the reason is why wouldn't you do that if it's, a, it's uh, basically free? And uh, the, and so the question is not uh, how we should distribute the working memory capacity. The question is, assume it's there. Then how would you perform your function the way you want the function to, to be done? And uh, in a way that, uh, forget about constraints. I mean, what uh, Seraph and Khan did in the 70s was amazing because they, they were constrained there was not much memory so to have an association with one byte that was, that was a feast to have uh this uh, this uh, passive kind of uh priorities with with just one bit that was amazing but now we have a ton of memory that we can spare so why why wouldn't we do that i didn't answer the question but i spent some good time talking <clears throat> Uh, once you have more working memory, I can see two ways of using it. Uh, um, one way is uh, to try to be quite logical, as you do in Aloha Nui, where you say, this is a very smart thing to do. We need to maintain this context. So let me build these things that is clever. Um, and the other would be, you know, perhaps my temptation as a messy person, that is to say, well, let's try to do something that best effort, you know, in the long run, it kind of works. And let's try to maybe learn what are the ways to make it more efficient to achieve it. an algorithm that is perhaps more similar to biology or, or to, to the way in which uh, some of the other world is robust, uh, less based on logic and more on best effort helped by heuristics and learning. Which way do you see networking going? Uh, <clears throat> not with biology, because... Uh you know god is unfair he, he god had millions and millions of years to allow evolution to happen and that's where we are today but humans uh because we only live that long we have to we have to get our results by monday and i think uh, having an artificial approximation to the to the to the nirvana is is the way to go if we don't want to wait for evolution to take over We have a question from Zoom, if uh -oh. we may. Um, how can AI help and hurt these information passing dynamics? Oh, I think, uh, well, humans will always find a way to uh, make technology hurt some ways, but I think AI, uh, any, any, uh, uh, any type of uh, machine learning or uh, any any approach AI or not that uses what the nodes know and remember and uh, try to do some processing to to uh, try to determine if I do this this is the, the the reward I would have if I do this other thing this is the reward I would have so hopefully we can have uh, machine intelligence um, use for the purpose of all the nodes in the network be, uh, do something that is not just efficient, but also fair and uh, uh, kind of uh, allow po uh, policy-based decisions 
to take place rather than okay you you can have uh, this packet sent reliably and that's it that's as if that's the service i provide but applications have different needs so i think to the uh, ai and machine learning can be used to to have a more uh, diverse set of services provided by the protocols <clears throat> I, I was one of uh, Professor JJ previous uh, PhD students. It's such a great honor to stand here to go back to the classroom time. <laughs> uh, so professors love tough questions, different questions. So I have a counter intuitive against what you said before. So WMC uh, is not unlimited. Right, so we have to efficiently use this uh, memory. Uh, so what I'm thinking is uh, there's this connectivity uh, context, which is uh, kind of like a bird of a, of a feather or, or group of interest uh -huh. that can share this information, uh, share this information. For example, a group of people, yeah. sorry, a group of devices wants to upgrade their firmware. And yeah. this firmware download doesn't have to be always going to the server. Instead, there's this group of node that has shared this in common interest. Then you can actually apply ITP to efficiently implement this if information download. So it, it's great. Uh, actually, this is applicable to my current company that could use this to improve the efficiency. So it's not a question, but I'm just <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So I think yeah. So I, I since you said you could use that in your company, I'm all ears now. Just <laughs> yeah. So I I agree. Is is in fact uh, if you look at uh, protocols like uh, Border Gateway Protocol BGP, who is runs on top of TCP, and a major problem with BGP is that TCP connections fail, and then they have to have all these constructs to. When you have a large autonomous systems that have all these BGP speakers and you have to have a connection among all the peer BGP speakers within the autonomous system, having a nexus that talks about all of the peers and all of the limitations with large, well, a lot of the limitations with uh, large autonomous systems that uh, have a bunch of BGP speakers will go away. So yeah, I mean, uh, David Walden was right. I mean, there is no need for end-to-end -end connections for reliable com. Yes. Uh, oh. oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, first, thank you so much for your talk. And secondly, uh, following up a little bit of the first question, uh, what do you think that will be the acceptance of the community for these new approaches for the like all the network stack? Since we like, I know that for like IPv6, for example, was a really like difficulty to get it accepted. Mm -hmm. How do you think that it can be accepted by the community? Good question. <laughs> uh, yeah, I uh, uh, fortunately or unfortunately for me, I uh, uh, not for profit, meaning that I don't know how to make money. So I, I really don't. But there is uh, there is hope that if we find the right niches for these new approaches like uh, iot deployments or server rooms uh, j just uh, the, the way that arpa decided to okay we are going to do away with ncp and well, uh, by golly we are going to use tcp it was because arpa controlled the or darpa at one point controlled the packet switching universe uh, we don't have that now and that's good but so I think the deployment strategies need to be developed, but it has to be company buy-in. Some company has to say, oh, like uh, Cisco way back then said, okay, I'm being clobbered by those uh, OSPF vendors. So I need something. So if we find deployment needs in IoT, uh, in the Nest, uh, in, in, within the homes, or for example, think of, of what would, wouldn't be great if Wi-Fi just be, behaved like a wired network? It would be fantastic. Wouldn't it be great if you started to download you whatever you want and you could download it from 
any site that is nearby you going to Lichun's point. Uh, the, the, the beauty of, of this uh, working memory capacity is that the receiver is in charge of what is being received and we can use in network storage in a productive way. But yeah, the, your, your deployment question is well taken. I think what has to be clever working with companies and there is a big opening with 5G and 6G because there is, uh, there is a, a push. Wi-Fi is not going to be the answer to everything. So there is a push for uh, private 5G or 6G networks. And that's where uh, connection-free, uh, connection uh, uh, collision-free, simple uh, Aloha Nui thing could take hold. But it has to be coordination with companies. <clears throat> so. JJ, um, thank you. Uh, I've, I've been a dean for almost seven years, so this part of my brain is atrophied a bit, so <laughs> forgive me. But um, one of the design principles in the early internet was the end-to-end -end principle, which basically said that the, the endpoints were smart, the middle of the network, a network was dumb. And the analogy is, is with the post office, which uh, basically says, I send a letter, the, it goes through a lot of hands, a lot of people, but the people don't really know what it is that are being sent. They just pass it along. If you start putting intelligence in the network and you start allowing the in-network elements to be able to read and understand, in fact, they have to, the messages, doesn't that create significant vulnerabilities, security vulnerabilities, and make the network less safe to use? Yeah, so my uh, answer to that question is that that makes me and my students uniquely qualified to solve the problem. No, seriously, what happens is the manifest, uh, one of the parts of the manifest is how to decode the, the, the thing. So it doesn't, uh, like we point out in the ICM paper, uh, part of the exchange is secret, but contrary to what we have in HTTPS that you, you, I mean, you cannot take advantage of in-network caching with a manifest. You can cache basically what looks like garbage in in-network in caches, and only the endpoints will know the secret formula, the, the secret that was exchanged between the producer and the consumer, assuming that is the uh, a, a good paying consumer, the, the, the secret will be shared, and then the rest of the of the structure is all garbage. And it's a lot of obfuscation and encryption put together, but your point is very well taken that there is a lot of risk. Once you have, once we have data sitting anywhere, there are very clever actors that can take advantage of that. And as clever as uh, some are, then there are many evil doers and it's, it's an ongoing problem. <clears throat> So here's another question. So you, you, you say you want to model it more on how people behave. Uh -oh. You basically say be polite, but people aren't polite. Oh, oh. <laughs> people cheat and people will try to shout at you because they don't like yeah. you. So yeah, how yeah. do you deal with those kind of things? Yeah, so uh, you know, the, even today as we speak with very little memory, we have man in the middle attacks and all sorts. So that is not changing, but yeah, you, I, 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 for the purposes of my talk, I was uh, really uh, making reference to the fact that uh, uh, the, make a contrast between uh, bacterium brain and reptilian or mammal brain. But yeah, I mean, it, it's not really that they are going to behave like people because God forbid, you know. So, but they are gonna re, uh, be able to take actions and uh, use a reward system using far more context, contextual information that will make uh, the algorithms robust and simpler compared to what they are today. But yeah, you, 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 so that will be a bad use of AI if we can have these uh, crazy uh, grun uh, grumpy protocols, yeah. Uh, JJ, my question is, uh, what do you envision as a content discovery model in this? Like, is it still the old buggy DNS with the, uh, uh, yeah. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, 
as you know, the, the CDNs have been along uh, for a long time along for a long time and uh, the quest continues. But uh, so the, the, the DNS is the longest serving, largest in scope caching system ever uh, implemented by humans. And uh, it has to change because it, it's, it's just waiting to be attacked. And, uh, but the, the beauty of this working memory capacity uh, thing is that uh, we can change, and you will like this because we can change the DNS into a routed DNS. And uh, uh, we don't have to go to, we don't have to have a tree or uh, DNS servers. We can have these distributors. And how do we get to the, to the right side with the right content with the right name is going to be through routing. And it will be music to brass ears because it, that involves a lot of policy-based routing to be developed. Yeah, but this is a, is a great challenge. Hi, JJ. Uh, thank you for your uh, wonderful talk. And uh, I really appreciate your contributions to computer networks. Uh, as I am also a networking researcher. And also I appreciate your enthusiasm of re-imagining -ima the future internet. So my question is that um, you have been trying to apply uh, intelligence to uh, computer networks, but uh, today people are talking about those uh, big data sets and big models in machine learning, right? But in networks, we usually want to have a small data and small states, you know, on devices. Do you think those two, um, you know, facts would uh, ally with each other, and uh, would would there be a you know a, a problems or difficulties if we want to apply machine learning to networks? Uh, you know, there are there's so machine learning and so machine learning. Even you can think of TCP as having a rather uh, limited reinforcement learning uh, thing. Okay, yeah. So, uh -huh. but the question is, uh, what is the meaningful learning that can be done in? And for networking, it um, in many cases has to happen real time. So that precludes many, many approaches. Um, but, you know, I, we, I just started with this uh, uh, new quest and uh, my first my first step was, uh, well, uh, I, my first step was really talking to Luca because uh, <laughs> uh, good things happen as a result. But my second step was, uh, it's not the case that we can do anything intelligent without far more memory. So uh, I'm at the stage that I, I, I am showing, this is what you can do with simple algorithms and much more memory than 50 years ago. Next step is, okay, then how do you introduce a, a reward system so that a protocol, uh, the, the, the actors take steps that are not greedy steps, but they benefit uh, the, the, the whole, the whole uh, system. And uh, how do you do this reinforcement learning in a in a good way? I mean, uh, but this is this is a, a labor of uh, of love by many many faculty members and people in industry and students. Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, good evening, Professor. Again, amazing talk. Thank you so much for the insightful. Just a point here about adoption of uh, large scale change like this right in the infrastructure you know it's just a big push or a, a exponential change or an order of uh, you know see cost savings or a benefit would not outweigh that mm -hmm. so in that context don't you still think working with ai or machine learning or with this with the traditional available plumbing mechanisms like tcp would still be deployable usable unless this really disrupts something here really is a very disruptive change at a lower cost it yeah affect a change yeah well you can always go from uh sacramento to the bay area using a 19 1950 car 
but and then you can you can have all this intelligence on, at both ends but why would you do that if you know you can do better so this is why i think academia is so needed because if you speak from the uh, commercial standpoint why would you obsolete your your cisco router or your juniper router that you're using today happily and then just uh, exploit the ai at the end but if if you are told and this is the same that happens in the 1960s with Paul Barron telling the DOD, well, you know, there is a better way than, than, than telephone calls. Um, I think it can be shown by someone that there is, uh, be, there is more than just statistical multiplexing. There is kind of, uh, it, it, we could think of it as context-oriented statistical multiplexing. Because it's not true that uh, uh, just doing the analysis that Kleinrock did, okay, uh, packet switching is probable better, pro probably better than circuit switching because the links are shared based on the statistics of the flows. But that doesn't take into account policies or 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 um, how important some flows are over others or multi-point flows or versus point-to-point -point flows. So there has to be some contextual thing uh, but that's something that could be shown by somebody thank god for academia because i wouldn't have a job either so <laughs> ah uh, so uh, thank you all for coming thank you jj for the illuminating talk and uh we are going to have a, a reception out there, so we are all invited to join JJ celebrating this occasion. Thank you all. Thank you all.